Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Generation GC podcast. My name is Molly Huddleston and I am your host. Today we're going to be talking about life changes from Youth Authority. Good Charlotte's sixth studio album, their comeback album, Post Hiatus, in 2016. And my guest today is Andrew Wendowski. Last week, we talked about Like It's Her Birthday from Cardiology, and a few days ago, we had a bonus episode on Not Another Teen Movie. Next week, we'll be talking about a song from Generation Rx. Andrew is the founder and editor of Music Mayhem Magazine, a website that covers everything from breaking music news from the big names to new material by up-and-comers. They do everything from concert reviews and photography to interviews, and recently they've also done some live stream festivals, which is very, very cool. And Music Mayhem covers everything from alternative to pop to country. Andrew has probably photographed your favorite artists. Some big names to mention are Taylor Swift, The Rolling Stones, and Cher, but just look at his social media. I mean, he's photographed everyone. He's also interviewed a lot of big names, such as Brantley Gilbert, Gabby Barrett, and Breaking Benjamin, to name a few. And in addition to running Music Mayhem, Andrew is a freelance photographer, shooting shows locally in Philadelphia, as well as touring with artists like Scott Stapp, Metro Station, and Chase Rice. And as you'll hear on the show, he's also photographed Good Charlotte a few times. Some things I wanted to mention, please visit antisemitism.card.co and blacklivesmatters.card.co to learn more about both antisemitism and the Black Lives Matter movement, respectively. We need to speak out against all forms of injustice. It's, it's not okay for anything to get swept under the rug. And if you see someone spewing any kind of hate, even if you think, well, I don't know, nobody's talking about that, does it really matter? Say something if you feel comfortable saying something, you know. It, if we excuse side comments and little small things that leads to a world where, you know, people just think it's okay to be hateful in bigger ways and more harmful ways. And that's not okay. Also, I know I mentioned on recent episodes and I've posted on Twitter, but the USPS is in danger. The changes that were uh, threatened have been suspended until after the 2020 election in November. However, it is still very important that we support the USPS and do what we can because we don't want those changes to ever take place. Independent artists and creators, small businesses, they all rely on the United States Postal Service in order to ship their products. UPS and FedEx are so much more expensive. And I know that not everyone that listens to this show is in the USA, but hopefully this still resonates with you. I learned recently that the USPS employs over half a million people and is the number one employer of veterans. You can go to your local post office or go online to USPS.com and they have stamps for everything from flowers to celebrating black culture to different holidays. And they even have a very nice set of spooky stamps for Halloween. Those are very cool. You can also order greeting cards from the USPS. And there's also a lot of free shipping supplies available. Do y'all know how much places like UPS and FedEx charge for, like, boxes and tape and envelopes? Like, gosh, it's, it's shipping and shipping supplies are so expensive. We need the USPS. Hey, as we're recording this, I went to the post office yesterday. I had to return a piece of clothing that I ordered online because it didn't fit right. And guess what? They were very friendly and they were very helpful. And I think something also important to keep in mind is that the Postal Service, the United States Postal Service, was not designed to be a money-making institution. It was designed to be a public service. It's something like we needed. It's so incredibly important. So yeah, please, please continue to support the USPS. I'm also going to uh, link a petition in the show notes. Finally, Generation GC stickers are here. Do you want a sticker? Two things you can do. Number one, support the show on Anchor. Go to anchor.fm slash Generation GC pod and click support. And that helps me sustain the show and have the right equipment, uh, headphones, microphones, 
windscreens, accessories, charging cords, everything I need to make the show sound good, as well as do things like actually print the stickers and get them mailed to you. And yes, I use the USPS. I put them in a little envelope with a stamp. Oh my god, it would be so much more expensive if I went to UPS to, like, buy an envelope and ship from them. You can also donate to a charitable organization. Don't donate, please, to change.org. Uh, I know a lot of petitions are on there, but ultimately I think it's better to put donations toward the cost itself. So go to blacklivesmatters.card.co and they list a lot of great organizations that you can donate to. Make a donation to one of them and send me a screenshot of your donation as well as your mailing address. So you're going to support the show on Anchor or donate to a charitable organization. Send me a screenshot of that support or donation and your mailing address. You can DM me on Twitter or Instagram at generationgcpod, P-O-T, or email generationgcpod at gmail.com, and I will mail you stickers. I will also occasionally tweet or post on the Instagram story about other ways you all can get stickers, whether that's good deeds you can do or ways to help spread the word about the show. So please make sure you're following. Anyway, that has been our intro for episode 23. Thank you all for tuning in, and now on to our episode. All right. Well, Andrew, thank you for coming on Generation GC. I'm so happy to have you here. And I'm so happy to be talking about Life Changes. It is the opening track, track number one on Youth Authority, which was Good Charlotte's sixth album released in July 2016 as their comeback album after Hiatus. I honestly couldn't imagine a better opening track for this record. I mean, I was just thinking the other day, uh, let the music play on cardiology, misery on Good Morning Revival, little things, a new beginning slash the anthem. I mean, they've, they've, they have a bunch of great openers, but this is also, this is such a great opener. Uh, following this track number two is Makeshift Love. So you kind of come out of the gates with something pretty sentimental and then go into Makeshift Love. This song was released for streaming on May 12th with a lyric video shortly after that. And then a music video came out that September. And it actually charted at number 42 on the Billboard Rock Digital Song Sales Chart. Uh, and they have played it live a whole bunch of times. I mean, if you've seen Good Charlotte Live anytime since July 2016 when they played the APMAs and played this for the first time, there is a good chance you've heard this song. Yeah, I was actually at that show. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I was like pretty far back and you were like come on come up like right to the front so I was I you had like led me all the way to the front for their set which was very kind of you and then in the stream like a couple people texted me that they could like see my face like yelling along to good <laughs> Charlotte during the stream and I was like that's my that's my vibe that's my vibe yeah it was a really good show that night with all the yeah. guests like Kel and Quinn and Water Parks yeah it was just, the APMEs, it was really fun. Like, I yeah. just had a great time getting dressed up and getting to hang out and seeing a bunch of good sets. I, I had a great time. Plus, it was really the only scene kid award show, realistically. Other yeah. than, like, the Rock Sound Awards and Kerrang. But did they do, like, award shows for those? Um, I think that there's one other, like a metal, it wasn't really the scene kid type of music. It was more right, like a metal yeah, yeah, yeah. award show. And it wasn't as big as the APMAs. Well, and then the APMAs, I think, did they have it in 2019 or was 2018 the last time they had it? Because I know there was... I don't think they had it in 2019. Yeah, because 20, 2018, they were supposed to have it at like a big venue and then at relatively the last minute it got changed to a much smaller venue in Cleveland and it was like all of a sudden not everyone who was supposed to go could go and it was like this whole thing yeah because that was the last year of Warp Tour yes well, it was 2018 the anniversary show and that was the last of APMA yeah right and it's you know I'm sure that the Warp Tour bands and crew filled out would always fill out probably around a couple hundred or a thousand people all in all in oh, those yeah. stands you know yep so 
Andrew, the first question that I ask every guest is, when did you first hear Good Charlotte? Like, how did you find out about them? And what did you think of them at first? So I remember the first time I think that I heard Good Charlotte was in the early 2000s. Okay. And I remember hearing their song, Little Things. Yeah. But also, it was kind of like a trio of songs. It was like the Little Thing song, uh, the Festival song, and the Motivation Proclamation. And I vaguely remember sitting on my front porch at my childhood home, listening to it with one of my friends at the time who showed me that, I think it was Little Things first, and then I really liked it. And then I was listening like by myself, looking into them more. And at the time, it was like the LimeWire days. Right. Where, you know, there was no like, oh, let's go on Spotify or YouTube. It was like, if you want it, you either buy it at the store or you go and somehow illegally download it. it yeah. Um, isn't really a thing anymore, I guess. Yeah. But, I mean, now that we have streaming and such, I feel like a lot of the yeah. purpose of things like LimeWire is non-existent. Yeah. And then after that, my uh, me and my friend were on our porch and we were listening to The Young and the Hopeless. Love and that. And I remember that album very well because I was one of the weird guys I guess that didn't go <laughs> towards the lifestyles and the rich and the famous and you know the hits and I gravitated more towards hold on that was like a song yeah. I really liked and then from that point I moved over to like oh lifestyles of the rich and the famous and then it was like all over the radio yeah lifestyles lifestyles was massive on the radio yeah it was insane and I think Hold On got some radio play, too, but it was definitely not to the level of Lifestyles or the Anthem. Hold On would be another, a good song for them to, like, bring back now. It'd be a good, yeah. like, connecting song for fans. Well, they, they still play it live at, I think, every show. Yeah. Definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. No, it's a great song. Um, I, uh, I have something I will chat with you about after we finish recording. Andrew, so you started Music Mayhem December 2013. What made you want to start this site? I mean, had you already been photographing shows at that point? Or was this like your first time getting into it? Well, I actually didn't have a website to photograph shows for when I first started. <laughs> okay. I, you know, the, the struggle yep. of needing a publication. When oh, you first I know start it. As a photographer. I know that struggle so well. I know that struggle <laughs> so well because I also lived it. <laughs> yeah. So I first started shooting shows in June 2012. And okay. it was, I guess you can call them a controversial band now because it was trapped. Okay. And I actually reached out to an email on their Facebook page. And it was actually the singer's email, Chris Brown, which is not go. the rapper Chris Brown. Right. <laughs> um, but when I reached out to him, he emailed me back and said, yeah, I'll definitely sort you photo pass, tickets, there. whatever you need. There Let you me go. know. Like, we would just want some photos and maybe if you can capture a few videos and just send us the files. Like, even if they're unedited, we just want some for socials. And yeah, that was just awesome. when socials really just started up, kind of. It wasn't as big as it is right? today. Right, because I, I think I got Instagram, like, summer 2012. Yeah. And then at the show, when I arrived, it was, like, my first time. I didn't even know what a photo pass really was or, like, what the access was. Oh, wow. So and you just, like, didn't really know, like, what what the deal I was. literally had no clue what I was going in for. I was just like, all right, cool, I got a photo pass. And then... I just, in my head, for some reason, thought this photo pass got me into a show with my camera. So the access basically granted me permission with a professional camera to come into a venue. And not knowing that I could go, like, in the barricade. And instead, uh... the show wasn't very sold, so I didn't really have a problem getting around. And I kind of just walked towards the front, and I was maybe three people off the barricade shooting from there. Um, the pictures are still online. Not the but greatest thing in the world. It was actually at the TLA. Oh, okay. Yeah, and TLA, I mean, that, if you get close and it's not, like, super crowded, like, you, you'll be fine. Yeah, but at the time, I didn't have any, like, fancy equipment. It was just, like, a starter camera kit right. lens, and it was just not the greatest stuff. 
And then I got some pictures. The band actually liked them. I don't know why. At this point, <laughs> I see them online sometimes, and I'm right, like, right. "Ooh, that's from me." Yeah, Ouch. I know that feeling. And then from there, I basically was reaching out to some publications, trying to find like some, you know, I don't know, like an outlet to shoot for. Right. And I came across this one outlet that was based in Australia called Noise Violation at the time. And I don't think it exists anymore, but I know the editor is still doing her thing and moved on to bigger and better things. Sure, yeah. And she definitely let me shoot a few shows, and it was very interesting. My first few shows, because it was also like a requirement for show reviews, and I was never really into that at the beginning. I was never really into writing. Right. And then it just kind of grew on me through the years. And then I kind of got fed up with working for other publications just because it's like, hey, can I shoot this show? Oh, no, someone else is doing it. Or oh, we yeah. don't want the coverage of that. So then I was like, all right, well, if they can do it, why can't I? Like, I'm not familiar with all this WordPress hosting and all that. So when I first started, like, it, yeah. yeah, I first started it on Wix, which was not the smartest idea because it just <laughs> ran so slow. <laughs> and um since then, obviously, I moved it to WordPress, but the Wix platform definitely helped me for several years, probably up till maybe two years. And it definitely helped me grow the publication and started it up and it just went like, on and on and on. I feel like there's something to be said about starting a website like that on just whatever platform is easiest because it... it kind of lets you just focus on like the content instead yeah. of like figuring out you know web development things yeah especially because if you dare do one coding thing wrong the whole website is broken yeah, yeah. no i circles and sound was, was on tumblr which was very easy obviously not very like customizable but very easy <laughs> mm -hmm. which you know it let me kind of focus on what i was doing but I, I like that you talked about just wanting, you know, the, the frustration of talking to other outlets and like, oh, they didn't want, you know, this coverage or that. You do a really big variety at Music Mayhem. Like, just going off your Facebook banner that's like Katy Perry, Simple Plan, Billy Joel, country artists, rappers. You have built like a really really big following online on socials and, and you get a whole lot of views on the website and it's it's all you in terms of like being in charge right uh pretty much yes i mean there's some friends here and there that help with like covering right. some shows or needing an outlet themselves to shoot a show for or right. interview I've somebody shot a few. Or i've shot a, a few festival. for you yeah so i mean it's pretty much me doing most of the work like i'd say maybe 90 percent of it and then i have right. other friends that help here and there that cover stuff that's either far away or stuff that I couldn't get to. But pretty much it's just me posting all of the content right now. Yeah. But obviously right now, <laughs> right now is a little different because nobody Very is <laughs> playing shows. Nobody's touring. You're still doing a lot of stuff on Music Mayhem. But speaking in a general sense, I mean, you have also toured as a photographer and you've shot a bunch of shows locally for, you know, artists and, and for record labels and, and other outlets on occasion. I mean, how do you balance what you do with Music Mayhem with, like, touring and freelance work? I mean, it's definitely a full-time job, balancing yes. all of them. Yes. Um, and I actually was doing this at the same time as working different retail jobs, like grocery stores and Walmart. Yeah. And it was so you definitely... Just kind of like all your time is taken up. Yes. I mean, yeah. it was like, wake up, go to work at a retail store, leave work, go home, get changed, run to a concert, cover the show, yep. come home, start to edit, start typing some notes up for the review. And it was like never ending. Yeah. But um, I pretty much run the whole thing by myself. It's self-funded. And I basically do what I can with Music Mayhem while I'm on the road. Because as you know, there's a lot of work on the road especially when sure. you're wearing more than one hat on the tour and it's definitely a lot of fun and worth it in the end but i mean i enjoy covering the shows i cover shows for music mayhem and the country ones now i really do for country now mm -hmm. and i also shoot for interscope records as they need me so it's not like a 
everyday thing or every week thing. Right. It's like it's when more so like, hey, so and so is coming. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've also shot for Republic Records in the past, which was just a few shows here and there. It wasn't even as much as Interscope. But it's definitely at times pretty hard because it's like you have to choose between do I want to go photograph for the label and get paid at this show or, oh, there's another show this night that I really want to attend Yeah, for mm-hmm. Music Mayhem. So it's mm-hmm. like a mixture Struggle. of having to choose between yeah. do I want to get paid or do I want to go and shoot a show? Yeah, it's it's a struggle. I've, I've felt that a lot too. And, you know, I I feel like usually I would choose to get paid, but because everyone wants to get paid and I feel like that's kind of the ultimate dream is to like get paid doing this stuff right but sometimes it's like okay there is something that's like a a once-in-a-lifetime show I don't care if I'm not getting paid like that's what I gotta do yeah so Andrew I was really excited to have you on Generation JC because a couple years ago spring of 2016 you actually got to join Good Charlotte for a few shows around the Northeast doing photography. How did that come about? Well, I remember that I really wanted to photograph the show when they announced their reunion tour, if you want to call it that, from their hiatus. Yeah. Um, this and was like it was only four shows at the time. Right. It was like the Northeast run in like the spring before Warp Tour. Yeah, it was in April 2016. Right. And it was like Philly was the first show, I believe, and then Boston, mm-hmm. and then New York, and then Sayersville, maybe? Maybe, yeah. I don't know. I was, Or maybe I Chicago? Maybe. Did they play, like, D.C. on that run? Oh, that's what it is. I think yeah. it was D.C. And I remember that I really wanted to show, like, shoot that show because, actually, I've never seen the band before that show. Crazy, yeah. Live. And I'm pretty sure that was like the very first time I'd seen them as a fan of them. I might have come across them at a show like opening and I wasn't familiar with them yet. And I actually photographed the Philly show, which was the first show of the tour. And it was a review and photo gallery for Music Mayhem. Mm -hmm. And then Benji and Joel took a liking to the photos I shot that night in Philly. And then their manager, which is also their brother, Josh Madden, reached out in an email asking if I would like to come out and capture their New York City show, which was a couple days later. And they asked me not only to shoot it, but to shoot it for them to cover for all press. And they wanted an exclusive gallery from their sold out Webster Hall show. Uh, Well, the whole tour was sold out. But I definitely won't ever forget that because it was actually the first time I also got published to all press which was one of the goals of mine to do. I'm pretty sure a lot of the scene type photographers had a goal at that point, some point. Um, So it's kind of like knocking out two birds at one stone, photographing a band I grew up liking and listening to, and also getting published to a magazine that I grew up looking at. And I don't know if I would say reading because it's mostly pictures, but definitely (laughs) looking at. (laughs) For sure. Well, I, I grew up reading alternative press, but I... Also, I'm, I don't know, I've also done a lot of writing. I don't know, which, which you have too, you have too. But yeah, no, they, they have a lot, of, um, a lot of great photography in there. And, yeah. uh, you know, I had a lot of years where my bedroom walls were just covered in, you know, whoever was in alt press that month just got ripped <laughs> up, taped on my wall. <laughs> Sometimes you buy yeah. two copies, you know, because one has to get taped on your wall and then one has to get, kept for safekeeping i actually still have a stack of alt presses in my room in a book i love that i think it's like two years worth i love that i have a couple copies of i mean i have a couple copies of each issue of substream that i was uh that i was in um but the only thing i like subscribe to now is cosmo (laughs) (laughs) Um, well, that's and a big it, actually, it is well no but like I've always liked you know women's magazines and I still will frequently read music magazines but I get most of my music news online although when I'm out and about per se if I'm at a Barnes and Noble or I see it in the airport I would totally buy like a Rolling Stone or a Spin you know depending yeah. on what I see on the cover yeah that that's the same connection with alt press that also led me to shooting the ap's apmas that year 
That's awesome. That's great. I love that. Andrew, I'm so glad to have you, you know, to have you on the show. I had asked you to what song you might want to talk about from Youth Authority so we could kind of tie in, you know, that that story of you getting to photograph some of their shows in the spring of 2016. Um, and you mentioned Life Changes. So why did you want to talk about this song in particular? I like the song Life Changes because I feel like it's a song that basically can speak to pretty much everyone, especially yeah. now with the coronavirus taking over oh, the world. God, I yeah. Mean, especially for those of us in the music industry, not only us as music photographers, journalists, but also like Good Charlotte as a band, as touring has pretty much come yeah. to a halt and you have to get really creative as it's just like forever changing guidelines and just so difficult anymore because everything right. is like changing every day. Yeah. So for me, I personally connect with the song more than ever now because there's no shows to shoot. There's no shows to go to and cover. There's no festivals. So you have to pivot. You have to pivot a lot. So now I'm like moving and shifting everything over to focusing on setting up interviews and covering artist news and finding like little quirky things on Instagram to make a story out of. And then there's like artists like Good Charlotte, for example, have then like had to get creative their own selves. And then they went and built a digital platform called Beeps for yeah. artists to connect with the fans and virtually ticket live streams and get paid while they're off the road because fans still want the live music, even though it's mm -hmm. definitely not the same thing, but it's no, kind but of a like, quench. I mean, Good Charlotte's Veeps live stream was, was really cool. And I've watched a bunch of live streams. Um, the other day I watched Social Animals on Instagram Live, which was a lot of fun. And I mean, you're also have created you did like i think you did two festivals over facebook live right like a rock yep, one and a country. country and a rock yep do you think you would do any more of those uh i want to but mm -hmm. i don't know if fans want to see that anymore because i feel okay. like they're just overwhelmed with the whole right like the, the everybody is on live stream like i've never logged in on instagram more and seen like at least 10 people live at a time right. every time you go and sign <laughs> on the live Instagram. And then it's like, if you scroll through Facebook, there's like, so-and-so is live and this person is live and this person is live. Oh, check out this person live on Friday. It's like right. a never ending live I, stream. I feel like that's the benefit of one band to do something really special, like a ticketed stream, like Good Charlotte yeah. did on Veeps. Cause then it makes it like more of an event. Mm-hmm. Did they have, like, a whole production for that? No, it was just Benji and Joel acoustic in, I think it was Benji's basement, but it was really cool, and they, they pulled out, like, all this super old memorabilia. Like, the set oh, was really from cool. their first show, yeah. yeah. That makes it unique and much more interesting than, exactly. like, yeah. here's me with my guitar on Instagram Live. Well, and, like, I saw Social Animals, and it was just Dedrick and his guitar, um, but he was, like, here's some new songs that we haven't released yet, you know? And like that, no, that was fun, fun. but no, the, the volume of, of live streams is pretty insane. Cause Luke Holmes has been doing that too with the whole, um, he's been basically doing a live stream maybe every other week and okay. in every single one he has released a song that's never been heard cool. that he wrote that week. Oh, and actually cool. one of them was such a fan favorite. It's called Six Feet Apart and it became such a uh, fan favorite song that he actually released it as a radio single. That is really cool. I love that. So back to Life Changes, I would love to talk about what the song means uh, or like what we think it means. So Andrew, can you share like what you think the song is about? Yeah, I mean, I think the song's title is pretty self-explanatory. Life yeah. Changes, it always changes. And not always now or right now, but every day. And I feel like the song will always be relevant and people, you know, always can connect to it. I mean, mm -hmm. my interpretation maybe of the lyrics would be like personally would be kind of going through a whole lot of things in life, but you just have to kind of power through it and hope for the best outcome on the situation, no matter what it may be. Yeah. And maybe for the band in the song, it seems maybe the song is about some struggles they went through throughout their career, their ups and downs, you know, all of the stuff that they almost broke up for, which is why they took a hiatus. We and almost died learning how to survive the fast life. Yeah. Yeah. And now singing basically how they overcome that and are stronger now than I feel like they've 
ever been because now yeah. they have a really strong relationship together and it's like really going good for them. Yeah. Until the coronavirus, you know, canceled right. tours and stuff. <laughs> no, totally. I think it's, I think that's just it. That change happens, ups and downs happen, but you know, you just got to shake it off and keep going. And I, I noted too that their whole reunion story is it's like a real life example of what I feel like is a trope that you kind of see all the time in fiction like movies and tv and books like you know you have this singer that gets really famous and then it's like well wait a minute my record label wants me to do all these things that aren't really the kind of music I want to make and then yeah. they almost quit and then they come back and do something totally different and their fans like love it and that's like what good charlotte did like in real life right i mean they they got really big they yeah they blew up they got super big you know they broke up they felt like the band just wasn't theirs anymore and then they get back together and and for the first album this album they're independent and they still have their diehard fans they get to make the music they want to make so it's like i i my <laughs> hypothesis, I think, that, like, I feel like a lot of people gravitated towards this reunion because it was such a a story that I think we see a lot of the times that people like that's, like, very gratifying to see. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a real-life story, and so it was cool to see it uh, play out. And, I don't know, definitely as, as a longtime fan, um, I'm curious if you felt this way too, but, you know, we'd heard Makeshift Love and 40 Ounce Dream, but getting to hear this song for the first time was incredible because it was like, okay, this is like the heart and soul, like the sentimental, the feelings of Good Charlotte that I love. Yeah, it was definitely different. I mean, this whole album was kind of sort of different from yeah. all of their past music. But it was also, and, like, pulled a lot from different bits and pieces of their past music at the same time. Yeah. Even though it's, like, so distinct. But also kind of giving a refreshing sound-ish that fans actually didn't. I mean, I feel like this is one band that they kind of have a refreshing sound now, a different yeah. sound from their past, and the fans weren't mad about it. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. bands will rebrand, and it's like, you're not heavy anymore. Right. I, I, you know, Emerosa, Bring Me the Horizon, both have done some oh, yeah. very pop things. Although, although I mean, the, uh, oh, Emerosa is an odd one to mention. Um, bring Me the Horizon, definitely, though. Yeah, Bring Me the Horizon did a pop record that people loved, so. Oh, yeah. And it actually got them some radio play, too. Which is insane. I don't know if you picked up on this, but it, this song calls back to Say Anything from The Young and the Hopeless, mm-hmm. which in Say Anything, they say, some say that time changes, best friends can become strangers. And then on this song, they say, you know that love changes, the pain it rearranges, best friends become strangers. So I think this was definitely like a very intentional callback because the outfield yeah. kind of calls back to the, to the Young and the Hopeless. So I think this was like very intentional. And, but it's, it's, it's interesting though, because say anything, I feel like comes from a place of just desperation and you like so badly need this person to say something. Mm -hmm. And then, and it's like, it's hard and you're like, what do I do? What do I do? Just say something, say anything. And then this song, it's like, Hey, stuff changes, life changes, love changes. Best friends might become strangers, but like, you gotta, you, you can keep on, keep it on. Yeah. I loved reading about the backstory of this song. So, Andrew, had you heard any about the backstory of this song before we did this podcast? Uh, not really. I. They might have said something live, but I really wasn't paying attention, probably, yeah. because I'm pretty. The first time they played it live was at the All Press Awards, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, like, I was shooting the show and I was, like, running around with the Right. So, you're just, like, <laughs> in that that kind of mode yeah I feel like I had I definitely had heard some of this before because I'm like doing my like putting my notes together for this episode and I'm like okay yeah I remember a lot of that um the backstory of this I 
love the whole backstory of this song. It's great. So Good Charlotte was due to go back to the studio on a Monday. And on a Saturday, two days before that, they all just hung out at Benji's house for hours. Their friend or their their kids all played with each other and they just hung out as friends. And, you know, they had seen each other. Obviously, Benji and Joel saw each other all the time. <laughs> They're brothers. They live down the street from each other. Um, but to, they, they got to have that time together that is, I think, really special. And then they get back to the studio on Monday, and this is the first thing they wrote. And then it's the first song on the record, and I think that was a, that's, that's a great story. Benji did an interview with The Aquarian, which is a New Jersey publication. They do a lot of just fantastic writing and, and media. Um, and he talks about on the first thing in the studio that you know, this song encapsulates that so well. It's very energizing, very uplifting, and that's where we're at in our lives right now. We're very optimistic. And they also told iHeartMedia, iHeartMedia, <laughs> this is such a great piece. Um, iHeartMedia did this piece that was just like all of their first experiences. And it was like, mm -hmm. first song we wrote, first show we played, etc. Uh, and they said that putting this song first on the record felt fitting because of the energy it has. Yeah, it definitely has a really good energy to it, especially live. Yeah. Um, so there was another really great interview that uh, Benji did with the AV Club. Mm -hmm. And he just talks about how they grew up together. They started the band in 96 when Benji and Joel were 17, they all grew up together and now they have families, they're married. And, and they, after spending all their youth together, they got to kind of go apart and find themselves a bit, but then they got back together and go back in the studio and have this amazing energy. It's so cool, and I love that they were able to find that energy again, because I feel like it's like you never know. You know what I mean? Like, if you do something, yeah. and then you take a break and try to come back, it's like, well, will it? It doesn't always work. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of bands out there who've tried to do it that couldn't. Yeah. Well, and there's, you know... I mean, Motion City Soundtrack, and, and I don't know the circumstances of Motion City Soundtrack's breakup. I, I don't know their whole, like, story as well. But, like, Motion City broke up 2016, and they did a reunion tour earlier this year, but I don't think they had put out, like, any new music. Mm -hmm. But It's like My Chem. They came yeah. back last year? Well, also? yeah, it was, like, on Halloween or something like that, they announced the show in December. Like, something in the fall, they announced the show in December. And then mm -hmm. it was, like, this January, I believe. They just have no luck. God. <laughs> and the coronavirus cancels their reunion tour. <laughs> well, no, postponed it, postponed it. All postponed it, yeah. Yeah. Um, my ticket is valid for some date in September 2021, and I will be there <laughs> you know whatever i don't care what happens i will be there yeah let's just see who they announce as the openers for that I if there even is one I, there's gotta be an opener like i'm i'm sure but like who would open it's rumored that? to be the used that would be cool and i love the used but I almost, I would also kind of love to see some, like, very small, like, relatively unknown band open, and then that unknown band blows the fuck up. But, I don't know, also, yeah, or like... or even just, like, somebody local from yeah. every city. No, nah, that's not gonna happen. But, like, I also remember I went to Blink's reunion tour in 2009, and it was, like, Blink, Fall Out Boy, and I want to say Panic at the disco. Probably, it sounds right. Yeah, and there might have been one, like, relative... I think there was one, like, relatively smaller opener, but it was still someone that I was, know like, that everyone. there was a tour like that, that Good Charlotte and Metro Station opened for. Yeah, yeah. And I think Cobra Starship, too. What year was that? 
I don't know. It was a while ago, and I remember going. Yeah, I was going to say Good I'm Charlotte sure at I Metro went Station. To that tour. I'm pretty sure it was Fall Out Boy, Good Charlotte, Metro Station, and I'm pretty sure Good Charlotte was the very first opener of the bill. Wow. What a bill. And I think Cobra Starship was above them. Bizarre. It's the Believers Never Die Tour, I think it was. Oh, yeah. It wasn't good, Charlotte. It was Cobra Starship, All Time Low, Metro Station, Hey oh, Monday, okay. Fall Out Boy. Okay. That... 50, Cent, 50 Cent played select dates for placing Metro Station. That's interesting. I saw Fall Out Boy uh, September 2018. I got very, very cheap tickets at the last minute. Um, mm. Like literally less than $10 to sit in the nosebleeds. And MGK opened. And it was like MGK and Every Time I Die. And like, it was funny because I think I was a tour. Was that the tour of Lincoln Park? No, because this was after uh, oh, that was after Chester Chester passed away. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but this was 2018, and I remember people just like didn't know what to make of MGK, and I was like, MGK is like so rooted in pop punk. Oh yeah. I feel like if MGK were He's a tour with Fall Out Boy, one. yeah, I feel like if MGK were to tour with Fall Out Boy now then people would like get it a little more now that he has songs like bloody valentine out mm -hmm. Which, he was supposed to tour with um blink and lincoln park yeah that was uh 2017 right yeah that was 2017 i think it was literally a few days before chester passed away because i had tickets for two shows and the yeah. it was the first show i was going to be able to photograph lincoln park and then that news came out the day oh. before I was, I was like, like uh, probably gonna get a photo pass. Like they hadn't totally confirmed it, but it sounded like they were gonna confirm it. And yeah. I was like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna shoot blink for circles and sound waves. It's like the biggest thing I've ever done. And then, you know, obviously it uh, got canceled. Yeah, that was a really good lineup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like I'd love to have MGK on this show though. That would be fun. Cause I it know- It would be a good one. Yeah. I, one of my, one especially of my, this summer, because he's releasing yeah. his tickets to my downfall pop punk album. Right. Yeah. No, that'd be, I don't know. I should, I should reach out to him. There's no harm in uh, reaching out to his publicist. Yeah. He's with Interscope. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll reach out. I'll reach out. Um, Andrew, do you have any memories or stories that you want to share about life changes? Um, I don't know if I have any real memories of life changes other than being at the show they first played it. Yeah. Uh, because I was at that show. Mm -hmm. and then it was very cool. They, I would definitely say the song is a memorable song because it's very like up to date with the times now. Yeah. And the music industry and everything that's just forever changing. But I mean, not only is everything changing, bands are changing, their sounds are changing, but I mean, I feel like Good Charlotte is one of those bands that aren't changing that much, but they changed a little bit and fans really yeah. liked it. And I mean, most of their songs are pretty timeless, so they're never really going anywhere. They, they change a little bit with each album, but I feel like you can always tell it's Good Charlotte. Oh yeah, you could definitely tell Joel and Benji's voice once you hear it. Yeah. Because it's kind of their signature sound that's so much different than a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, but you, you, and you also have like, people talk about bands changing. I think a lot of people talk about Fall Out Boy. Um, and I, I'm kind of like, I, I, I feel like Fall Out Boy's change has been a little, a different thing than Good Charlotte's, whereas Good Charlotte just, I think they, they mix it up with every album. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Fall Out Boy has kind of had this progression from, like, pop-punky emo to, like, sort of a little more theatrically emo, a la Panic at the Disco, kind of, you know, with, like, the super mm -hmm. long song titles and such, to rock and arena rock and eventually this pop thing. It's been, like, a, a gradual transition, I would argue, for Fall Out Boy over time. So, yeah, definitely. I could definitely see that. Like, if you listen to Mania and the last album you'd listen to, them, listen to from them was, like, Take This to Your Grave, you'd be like, what the fuck? Yeah, definitely. 
I like this album though. And I, I, I mean, I think this album as a whole, I don't, I, I don't think generation RX would have worked as the comeback album. No, definitely not. <laughs> like, I feel like this had to be the comeback album. And I think for me, just the big like story with this song is just hearing it for the first time and being like, you know, I liked makeshift love. I liked 40 ounce dream, but hearing this, I was like, all right, they really are back. Yeah. I like this song the best out of those three songs. Yeah. Same. I feel like 40 ounce dream is very different from them. It was just like a different that I was like, okay, this isn't bad. I can listen to it, but it's not one that I would go and turn on. Yeah. And I feel like it's a very odd vibe live, that song. Are they? Because yeah. it kind of slows everything down. Right. It's, I feel like 40 ounce stream acoustic, like in an acoustic set would be like perfect though. Yeah, that would be cool. But they've also done this acoustic, as you can see in the music video so the music video was directed by elijah alvarado who also directed the life can't get much better video and mm -hmm. it's a compilation of black and white montage of footage um from the spring tour they did in 2016 supporting all time low in the uk as well as on warp tour that summer uh, and there's like a little poster at one point kind of looks like you know the whole album cover is like a collage of old show posters and there's mm -hmm. like a little poster that says life changes so i thought that was really cute and video is great i mean it's it's shots of them on stage but you also see them like with their children you see them just hanging backstage you see them meeting fans and it just it made me super nostalgic for that summer because i was on the tour that summer and i I feel like I need to go back and rewatch it and like look really, really close because I photographed them several times on Warp Tour. And there were a couple times that in the video where like you can see the photo pit. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I need to go back and watch it really, really close and just be like, can I pick myself out in any of these? <laughs> that would be cool. I mean, my big thing that summer was I had bright pink hair, uh, which you can't see in black and white footage, but I'm sure I could still, if I look real close, I could, I could see if I'm in any of those shots. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Warp Tour, Warp Tour needs to come back. I feel like Warp Tour should make a big comeback after, you know, maybe <laughs> in two years. When Can you shows imagine? A lot of happen. No, <laughs> but it's like, but I was just talking about this on Twitter today that like, even when shows happen, it's gonna be very different yeah and it's also gonna be like there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be like you know what shows are happening but like i'm not comfortable going for like a few years yeah i could see that you know and something like oh, especially warp tour where people are traveling internationally and everything um a lot of you yeah. know bands come from overseas and stuff uh i don't know i'm i had amazing memories on warp tour i got to do the tour it was fucking amazing. I'm so glad I did it. But I'm okay that the tour isn't happening now. Yeah. I mean, I like the one they did for the 25th anniversary on the beach in yeah. Atlantic City. Although it was excruciatingly hot. And it is definitely not fun. We're summer in my yeah, life. Yeah, and it's definitely not fun to walk through sand. Because, yeah. let me tell you, your feet kill you after that day. Well, yeah, and like... I wore sneakers and it was just sand in my sneakers, sand in every crevice of my body. And like, yep. okay, maybe I wouldn't have gotten sand stuck in my shoes if I wore flip flops, but like, it was They're really even harder to walk in. <laughs> yeah, and it was like a really far walk from like the tents to catering. So oh, like, yeah. anytime you had even to like, to the yeah, like, <laughs> were you there both days? Yep. Were you, so were you, you were shooting it, right? Yep. That's, a, that's another problem. When I was shooting it, I couldn't get, physically couldn't get from the main stage to the smaller stage that was down near the tent. Because yeah. I physically couldn't because there was just so many people in the stand and it's not hard to, it's like not easy to navigate through a person as well as sliding through the fan. Unless you're going to straight like wade in the water and get your feet Pretty much, up. yeah. I mean, that was the only 
possibility to really get through anything because yeah. that's the only empty space there really was. I wished I had brought flip-flops. Like, I had flip-flops in my suitcase, like, in my hotel room. But I wished I had brought flip-flops and, like, put them, like, in my bag that I brought to the show. Because it would have been nice, like, at the end of the day after packing up to, like, dip my feet in the water. Definitely. It was a good lineup that year, too. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a good lineup. I just kind of wish that they would have brought back some more nostalgic Warped Tour bands, like Paramore or something. Those yeah. Ones, like, quote-unquote headliner. I mean, but they had Blink. They had The Used. They had, I think, Simple Plan played. You know, they had... I, I feel like they got a, a decent amount. Um, I also, like, I don't think I watched any full sets because mm. I was, like, at my tent and working. But I did get to see, like, probably half of Good Charlotte's set, which was great. Um, and getting to see, like, a little bit of The Used as I was walking to catering was very cool because I've still never been to one of their shows. Really? That's mm -hmm. shocking because they're one of those bands that I feel like are never not on tour. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it just, you know, I follow, I loved The Used when I was in high school. And I think I just never followed them that closely after. And so it wasn't mm -hmm. until, like, recently, definitely, like, being friends with Allison Coletta, who oh, yeah. loves them and seeing, like, all her pictures of them and stuff has made me go, like, fuck, I need to go see them. I need to go see them. So... I would, once it is uh, safe to do so, I would really like to see them because I think they would be amazing. But the big one for me that I haven't seen is Green Day. Me too. I have never seen them or photographed them, and I would really like to see them. I would love to see them. I mean, I don't know. I did not love... Actually, no. The last record I liked, it was like Father of All Motherfuckers or something. Yeah. And I was, was like, oh, one. this is great. It's just like tongue in cheek, fucking sarcastic pop punk. <laughs> like, it's great. It's very tongue in cheek. And you have to be like aware of that. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was fun. I didn't like it was the one before it that I didn't really like. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been like here or there on Green Day's albums, but like all of the hits I love. And, you know, I American Idiot was revolutionary for me. Oh, yeah. I feel like everybody listened to that album at some point in their life mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a while. I feel like oh, yeah. every person has. Um, so I just wanted to bring up some press about this song. Mm -hmm. So Joel told Upset Magazine that this was probably his favorite song on the album. Just going on to say that it's truly special to me. And I think there's a couple of songs fans will love if they like Life Changes. There's a lot of that on the record. I mean, I think that's clear. You know, Life Can't Get Much oh, Better, yeah. The Outfield, Carcel of People Moving On. These are all songs that are, like, sentimental and a little nostalgic and really point towards that, like, love they have for both the music and what they're doing and the, the love and connection they have with their fans. Mm-hmm. So, oh, Andrew, this is good. Alternative press. So <laughs> before, before I read this, before I read this, Andrew, if, if I were to tell you alternative press compared the chorus of Life Changes to an artist, like what, what artists would come to mind for you? Um, somebody like, I don't know, maybe a Blink-182 or... Uh, I'm trying to think. Blink-182 or maybe even Simple Plan or Taken Back yeah. Sunday. Right. I, I will say, as a resident of Central New Jersey, I was quite honored to see this name come up. I would possibly argue its accuracy, however. And I'm leaving little bits of, uh, I'm taking my time saying this because I want listeners to really ponder, hmm, what artist is Alternative Press comparing this song to? Think about it for a second. Well, Alternative Press compared the chorus of this song to Bon Jovi. 
<laughs> I'll read this. I'll read this blurb, and then Andrew, we can discuss a little bit. Good Charlotte's past colors their present in a big way on Youth Authority. The sixth album from the Maryland turned California pop punks (parentheses their first since going on hiatus in 2011) is stuck with moments that recall nearly every era of the band's existence. The opening track, "Life Changes." complete with an arena rock chorus that channels Bon Jovi circuit, It's My Life, has the same pogo-worthy energy of the anthem. <laughs> so, like, Andrew, what are your thoughts? This is the show where we see how other people critique Good Charlotte, and we critique other people's critiques of Good Charlotte. Um, well, I definitely don't see that comparison. Bon Jovi is kind of his own thing. Not saying that Good Charlotte isn't, but right. I mean, I feel like Bon Jovi has a very unique classical rock sound, kind of, mm -hmm. and it's definitely far from like a pop punk sound at all. I like, mean, maybe the it, energy of it. Was it just be. that they said the word life? I, I don't even know. I mean. I don't even know sometimes what Alt Press is thinking <laughs> with some I mean, of the articles that come out. Same, same. But I, I, I just like wonder how this came about. Like, was it because they said the word life? Like, is this writer also from central New Jersey? Was this writer just on a big Bon Jovi kick? And they, or are you they know, looking for something quote worthy that other right, outlets would critique right. and pick up? Right. Which, which happens. Um, I don't know. I've also have made comparisons between artists that like are sometimes hard to get across and this was like a pretty short review and I've 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 sometimes made it, comparisons between artists that are like very hard to translate mm -hmm. like that. But I had like we had a a client at my job. I work at a music video promo company and we had a client that was, I forget their name, but they were like a country pop duo or trio. Mm -hmm. And they had a song about getting down and dirty in the back of a Mercedes S class. And I, I compared <laughs> them to the chain smokers because uh -huh. I was like, they're, they're kind of this crossover artist that is singing about getting down and dirty in the back of a fancy car. <laughs> and it was like, it was like comparison, I think I called them the chain smokers of country, actually. And it was a comparison that people, that like on the surface you would kind of be like, what the frick? But, yeah. like I explained <laughs> it to my boss and I was like, I, I know you don't know who the chain smokers are, but like this is who the chain smokers are, this is what they do, so like, this is why I think that description fits and I still stand by it. So, yep. um, if, if the writer of this Alternative Press article wants to uh, chat about their, their reasoning for comparing Life Changes by Good Charlotte <laughs> to It's My Life by Bon Jovi, I would be more than happy to have you on the show. And I mean that with all sincerity. I welcome any critiques of our critiques of how other people critique Good Charlotte. That would be a very interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, I would love to get, get meta. You know, just have like a little, have a little chat with that person for, you know, five or six minutes. Um, there was a great interview, <laughs> a different tone. Joel did an interview with Entertainment Weekly where he talks a little bit about being a parent. So Entertainment Weekly says that, you know, some of the songs on this album, including Life Changes, feel really nostalgic. Uh, you talk about how grand and life-affirming individual moments can be, and they asked if the band have, were looking back while making this album. And Joel says, this is like a big quote, so I won't read the whole thing, but Joel says, as you become a parent, you do become nostalgic, but you question the future for your kids. What is my footprint on the world? Who am I? What am I contributing? And, you know, he says that you have to examine your footprint on the world, and it's something he and his wife, Nicole, do all the time. Uh, a little later, he says that the band, after shutting the band down for five years, that they looked back and said, can we take all the good things we did in Good Charlotte and repeat them and leave behind any of the youthful angst or selfishness that we feel like we had? In an honest way, looking back, we did have a lot of nostalgia on this record and fondness for some of the things we did, 
we were pretty off in our intentions in the beginning. It's it's like a fascinating interview. I read the whole thing, and uh, they they get into some great conversations, and which which is cool because I feel like publications like Entertainment Weekly or, or People sometimes you don't get like such a detailed conversation about yeah like the music itself or even from these types of bands right right yeah so that was and and they were an independent band at this point obviously they were an independent band with you know a pr team and and management and a great reputation and and who had you know lots of people that were excited about it but so lastly uh exclaim did a little write-up when this song came out where they had a great nickname for the band so i'll just read that and it's, it's fun by the way when i see like news posts about a band that aren't just copying and pasting the press release because that's so like cheap i think mm. so this is good because you can tell they 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 actually wrote this out it's time once again to engage in some subtle anarchy. Perhaps you should lean back in your chair a little too far, eat candy for lunch, or call your parents and tell them to F off. And they spelled F E F F. <laughs> um, after all, light punk maestros, good Charlotte, are back with another anthem. Light punk maestros, we love to see it. And that's a great way to put it. It is. It really is. <laughs> Their latest three-minute banger is called Life Changes, which we can only assume is a song about puberty written by men in their late 30s. Either way, <laughs> it's a fairly delightful little pop-punk number built on a single jangly guitar chord. Um, da -da -da, it's got us even more hyped on GC's upcoming Youth Authority record. Soon it will be safe for the punks to proudly walk them all once again. I love <laughs> this because... You know, a lot of critics don't like Good Charlotte. That's not a secret. It's something we talk about all the time on this podcast. We read the the snarky reviews and we go, what the frick were these people thinking? Like, this person got the band totally wrong. They completely missed the point. This, this little write-up was great because... I feel like it's a very self-aware music writer. Like, this is a person who likes Good Charlotte but they're like completely aware of what they are and the band's kind of reputation and place in the world. So I thought that was really fun. So Andrew, how has the song, I mean, it's only been a few years, but how has this song held up for you? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like this song is one that stands the test of time. As totally. a song that will truly Especially be able to right connect now. with yeah. people. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, yeah, especially right now with all the guidelines and policies changing, the virus... Well, and, and the idea sort of, of like, we almost died, you know, trying to live the fast <laughs> life or whatever. It's Literally also, like, I point. feel like, yeah, like, people have been very much forced to slow down. I mean, and they really have no option. I mean, yeah. how many times have you ever been in New York City and see not one person in Times Square? I mean... Yeah. Even the little people, like the people dressed up as characters trying to get some money so they can take in some pictures with kids and stuff. So I mean, weird. literally walking through and there's legitimately not one person in Times Square. There's actually a music video out from a rock, I wouldn't call it a band because it's just one guy, Des Rocks, and he did a music video in a completely empty Times Square, just yeah. him and his phone, which is like pretty epic and it's a very interesting sight to see because every time i've ever been in new york no matter the time of day and i've been there at all times of the day yeah, from times like square having, is like insane always times square is always going crazy there's always yeah. billboards and hundreds of people everywhere even at three in the morning there's still at least yeah. like 50 people in times square no we had we have a client um alex sparrow who little plug is on the Netflix show Space Force? He plays Bobby, Captain Yuri. He's actually his character on that show is super funny. Um, he has a song called "Let's Stay Home Tonight," which was written mm -hmm. well before quarantine. Like it was just a kind of sweet, like "Oh, baby, let's have a night in" kind of thing. 
but yeah. he he made like a lockdown video uh, in Los Angeles, and they're they're like it's it's funny because they're like chasing for. Uh, toilet paper and hand sanitizer but they're like running through like all parts of los angeles that i'm like why are there like no people like what's going on i mean that's what five finger death punch just did with their a little bit off i think it was music video Mm -hmm. um the singer ivan went into he lives in vegas so he went to downtown vegas all the casinos and stuff god he was literally walking down the strip and down the Mm -hmm. center of the street on the bullet like right down the center of the street where there's legitimately not even a car driving past and the casinos are closed. There's not a single soul around. And that's like unheard of in L in all those places, LA, New York, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. Like it's just crazy to see. Yeah. That's It's almost scary. Like is the world ending? I don't know. I don't know. When I've like gone to see my parents and, and such like, you know, I have to get on the highway, and I'm like, okay, there's, like, cars on the road, you know, um, so it's not, oh, like... Oh, now it seems like people are just over yeah. it. They don't care anymore. It's like... Well, like, uh, Disney World opened back up. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Which, like, I don't know. Disney World... Which is also unheard of for Disney World to close. I'm pretty sure that's the first. Disney World is the last place I would, like, be comfortable going, I think. Like, even less than, like, a Me concert, too. I think. I think it would be the last place I'd want to go right now, but at the same time, it's also a place that I wish wasn't coronavirus right now because right. I've seen pictures and stuff online, and there's, like, rides, like, I don't know, the Avatar ride that's a normally a two-hour wait is a five-minute wait, which is, like, holy crap. Yeah. Um, when do I book a plane ticket? <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, mm, I don't think I could survive wearing a mask through Disney World because right. it's just so hot without a mask. Like, even if you wear a little bit of clothes, like the least possible amount of clothes, you're still dripping with sweat and like it was, unable to move. <laughs> it was hot this weekend. Like, I, I got a foot tattoo Saturday and good thing I got a foot tattoo in hot weather because I've like only been wearing flip flops <laughs> since then. Yeah. And I like got a smoothie bowl, like an acai bowl. And I was just like, holy fuck, like my smoothie is like melting. And then yesterday I was just like, I just need some fresh air. So I drove to this park near me that has a really pretty view of the water. And I, I found a bench no one else was sitting on with a nice view and I brought a drink, but when I wasn't drinking my drink, I kept my mask on. Yeah. Even in the shade, it was hot. But you gotta, you gotta do it. You know, you gotta wear the mask. Like it's, it's not, yep. it's not optional. Some people don't think they do, but it's pretty much mandated around the country. At, yeah. At some point. And even if it's not mandated, it's like the right thing to do. Respect. I think. Yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, if a nurse can do it all day and save people's lives, so can you. Exactly. So can you for 30 minutes at the grocery store. <laughs> Your target trip. Your yeah. little target trip. Uh, you can definitely have a mask on and survive. Yeah. And maybe even buy a few more masks because, you know, you fill up carts at Target when you go in there. Right. Yeah. I have, I have a couple masks that I kind of rotate. I just bought... Um, black masks actually because you know i don't know i just don't like having a blue hospital mask yeah so i bought those masks but in the form of a black mask okay yeah and i was like this is cool it's so on brand (laughs) yeah right i have a purple sequin one uh which i also have a a matching purple sequin scrunchie Mm -hmm. and i have a black one with the walk the moon logo on it i have a zebra print one uh and i also have a couple bandanas but i've generally been using the fabric ones and then just like whenever i do my laundry you know just tossing a few in the wash yeah well like the good charlotte song all black you know that's all that i ever wear so i need to wear those black (laughs) masks exactly yeah keep that aesthetic consistent so Andrew, what has Good Charlotte meant to you over the years, and how has that changed? Uh, Well, Good Charlotte's always been in, like, my top five, maybe top ten favorite bands Mm -hmm. in the Warped Tour, alt-rock, punk scene and music. And, I mean, I've never really heard a song from them that I didn't like. 
I mean, yeah. pretty much all their songs and all of their music is pretty anthemic and it's like overall puts you in a better mood, even though some of their songs are not for that reason. I get and that. when you yeah, hear yeah. it, it just, it just makes you want to like get up and like do something. It kind of energizes you and puts this, you in the mood. This song just, is a great example of that. Yes. And it, I mean, it really hasn't even really changed over the years. I feel like all of their music, it just never gets old. It's all timeless. And even their classic songs never get played out. And I mean, their songs will always be some of the best played at emo nights, along with like oh, yeah. My Ken, Taking Back Sunday, Simple Plan, The U, Some 41, bands like that. I mean, I feel like those artists just have hits that are just so timeless and they're never going away. Yeah. And I just feel like people can connect with their songs, either in a good Absolutely. or a bad way. Yeah. But everybody knows a good Charlotte song. I feel like there's not one person that doesn't know Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous. I mean, if they listen to this type of music, they had to have heard a good Charlotte song at some point, rather it be at them opening for a show or a headlining show that they were seeing an opening band or at Warped Tour or mm -hmm. like on the radio or even just as like one of the playlist songs before a band performs right, right. a regular show. I mean, everybody has heard a good Charlotte song. They'll never yeah. be outplayed, I feel like. Everybody likes them. And I mean, all of their music pretty much, it might not get as much radio play anymore because I feel like a lot of radio doesn't cater to rock anymore. And it's more yeah, like, I mean, but there's there is like rock stations on Sirius and stuff, and like we have an oh yeah, like rock Sirius, station, yes. you know. And then in Philly, we have one hundred four five. They'll play yep. some. Yeah, we have ninety two three stuff. up here. I mean, they'll play some things. Like they might throw a good Charlotte song in there if they were going to one of their shows coming up. Right. But it's not like on. You're their not regular getting as much thing. stuff like this on the top forty, though. Yeah. No. I mean, I feel like that's why most artists in the rock scene, the country scene, pretty much any genre other than pop, I feel like they all try at some point or another to put out a single that caters to pop because sure, they want to yeah. get on that top 40 charts and they want to be on the radio. I mean, that's, I feel like a goal for most artists, like yeah. they need to be on the radio because that's when you start charting and getting certifications and awards and more yeah. people hearing you and more fans and bigger shows because more promotion. And then I feel like a lot of bands are more are now trying to gear themselves into the pop world so they can get some radio play, even if it's just Definitely, on rock yes. radio. Because I feel like the rock radio stations don't have much, I wouldn't say respect, but like they don't really have much to play when it comes to that. Like I couldn't turn on a rock radio station in my area at least. Other than all, like all, I think it's all 1045 now. I used to be Radio 1045. They rebranded. And I don't think that they really play that. They're more like Andrew McMahon, right. 21 Pilots. 1975, yeah. That type of stuff. Not more, like, not the Warp Tour stuff. There needs right. to be a radio station for like the Warp Tour scene, pop punk music, because they don't right. get that. And I feel like that would be a huge radio station if there ever was yeah. one because I, there's a lot of people who want that. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I, I'm sure some of it also comes down to like who has what kind of radio promo teams people have. You know? Yeah, that's true too. And a lot of the independent bands don't even have a radio team. Right, that's, that's the thing. And, and like I, I'm on the video side obviously so so it functions differently but you know uh, an artist could be like a decently big artist but it's like if the video programmer is like you know if they don't have a good video promo team if they don't have someone pushing their video then they're not necessarily going to get like all the big ads right yep and they also don't get like if they don't have a budget to make a really good video Right. Plus, I feel like most of the independent band, like, I feel like most warp Tour punk, pop punk bands, other than, like, obviously the big, big names, are pretty much, like, all independent Independent labels, days. yeah. Not mm -hmm. all of them, but most of them. Well, they're on independent they're labels, on, like, like... Like, independent labels, or they're trying yeah. to, like, build their own up. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, there's bands like A Day to Remember who can 
because they have a budget to kind of build their own brand up while also funding their own music. Yeah, but hadn't they? Been, they they, they had breaking. been on other labels prior. Oh yeah, they've been on like I think. Well, actually, they just recently signed a Fuel by Ramen. Okay. So I know that's what they're releasing their new record on. But their last record, Bad Vibrations, and I think Common Courtesy as well, was released on what they call ADTR Records, which was, I think, service through Epitaph Records. Okay. At least one of those albums was. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I'm curious what Good Charlotte will do with the next album, but who knows? I mean, I feel like everybody right now should be working on new music because yeah. what else is there to do? <laughs> yeah. There should be a lot of good music coming out of this because not only in like the rock world and everyone, like every genre right now is pretty much on hold. Yeah. The country scene is trying to kind of sort of pick out with the drive-in shows. Yeah. And I don't know if I would even, I mean, I would probably go to one to experience it, but yeah. like, I don't want that to be the new way of shows because you know, right. that's not the same feeling as being at a live concert. Exactly. And the last yeah. show that I went to in March was Silverstein at the Fillmore. And like the virus was still going. It was right before everything shut down because it was on March 8th. And it was like a very almost eerie vibe to be at a concert with all this craziness. Yeah. Well, Andrew, this has been awesome. I mean, do you have any last words about life changes about Good Charlotte or about yourself? Well, I mean, pretty much life is always going to change. But yep. I feel like Good Charlotte yep. is not anywhere. So I mean, it's one positive thing to look at. And well, thanks for having me on here. It's Thank you for coming on. About it. And I know you've been trying to get me on for a while. Yeah, no, it's finally been great. worked out. Yeah. And I hope that we're able to get out sometime soon to see a show because it's mm -hmm. kind of sort of depressing without live music. Oh, it's so and awesome. it's definitely missed. And I can't wait to be able to get out and shoot a show again because. I mean, this world is just so crazy right now. Yeah, I know. I, I had, like, largely taken a break from shooting shows for, like, most of last year. Like, I shot a few, mm -hmm. but I was kind of like, I'm going to be, like, very selective. But now I'm like, all I want is to, like, pick up my camera and shoot a show. I know. I mean, I have some shooting stuff coming up. It's all, yeah. As long as all goes as well and I'm not crippled, um, you know. Yeah. So... I'm supposed to be shooting some weddings coming up, so oh, that luck. should be interesting. Thanks for letting the family members, so I don't have to be too nervous. <laughs> right. Um, Andrew, this has been great. Uh, I have been doing a Generation GC and Friends playlist, and I, I forgot to put this in the notes, but I've been doing a Generation GC and Friends playlist where I just include the songs that we've covered on the show and recommendations from our guests. So can you give me a song recommendation? Just anything besides Good Charlotte, any, anything you've been listening to lately? Um, is there a specific genre? No, anything. So, I mean, when it comes to different songs, I've been listening to a lot of both country rap but also like i've really been digging the new crown the empire okay i mean it's not really new i wouldn't call it new because it's really not new it's more so a re-release of an acoustic like but acoustic okay so they just put out it's zero seven one zero two zero one zero, which is the album which is basically july 10 2010 because they're celebrating oh, okay. their anniversary and their song what i am on there has been playing a lot lately on my Spotify. It's one of Gabby go. Barrett's song, I hope. It's been very addictive, catchy, because cool. she's really, really good. <laughs> I'll put both of those on the playlist. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Um, where can people keep up with you and keep up with Music Mayhem? Well, musicmayhemmagazine.com and my socials are all over are awendowski photo and also awendowskiphoto.com. Perfect. Andrew, thank you again for coming on the show. This has been awesome. Listeners, thank you for tuning in. My name is Molly. I've been your host. Last week, we talked about Like It's Her Birthday from Cardiology. A few days ago, we had a bonus episode on Not Another Teen Movie. And next week, we'll be talking about a song from Generation RX. As a reminder, please subscribe to the show on iTunes. Rate, leave a review. It would make me so happy. Follow us on Spotify, Google Play, subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
follow, leave reviews, rate the show, we'll spread the word, tell all your friends. Thank you guys for tuning in. You can follow the show at Generation GC Pod, P O D, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can follow me, Molly, at M Huddleson, M H U D E L S O N, on Twitter or Instagram. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll be back next week.